Hello, my name is Brian Cronin. I welcome you to part three of this tutorial, EQE paper B, reply to an EPO communication. Part three covers the final product, amended claims, and the reply to the EPO communication and comments. Here is a brief introduction. So we have part three. Um, the EQE paper B we're dealing with is a closure for a beverage container. We're going to deal with the final product and comments. I assume that you have already followed uh, the tutorial part one, which was assimilating information, and the tutorial part two, which was organization and planning. In this uh, part three, I will go through the motions of writing the reply letter, present my own answer, and make some comments as to how you can develop your own answer. What, however, does the final product consist of? The final product of paper B is as follows a set of amended claims that can be handwritten or written over the client's proposed claims or over the claims as filed using cut and paste or handwriting and a handwritten letter to the EPO without superfluous matter such as the address or the manner of sending by telefax or by electronic transmission and so on your letter to the EPO should cover all relevant issues in a structured manner. For this, it is useful to subdivide the letter using headers. There is no need for you to write explanatory notes to dialogue with the client or the examiners. This is positively discouraged and in fact, no credit is given for writing notes to the client, so it's an entire waste of time. It's useful but not compulsory to use headers. I use headers in my uh, specimen. Next is my set of claims for submission to the European Pat Patent Office, starting with amended claim 1. As you can see, I have taken the client's proposal and deleted electromechanical that is now replaced by a piezoelectric. This amended claim follows uh, the plan that we worked out before and reads as follows. Claim 1. Closure for a beverage container. The closure being arranged for accelerating the maturing process of a beverage. The closure comprising a body, a vibrator unit for generating sound waves in the beverage, an air ch channel is crossed out, and means for conducting electrical sign signals to the vibrator unit. And a new characterized clause characterized in that the vibrator unit comprises a piezoelectric vibrator for generating the sound waves at different frequencies. Now we turn to the dependent claims. As you can see, once again, I have overwritten the client's uh, proposal. Claim 3 is deleted. Former claim 4 is now claim 3 and is amended. Claim 5 is amended too. The amended claims read as follows. 2. Closure according to claim 1, wherein the body is made of wood, cork or a synthetic polymer. That's unchanged. 3. Closure according to any preceding claim, wherein the vibrator unit 4 comprises a vibrator plate having a parabolic surface. 4. New claim, closure according to any previous claim, comprising an air channel. Five, also a new claim, 
system of a bottle in combination with the closure according to any previous claim, wherein the bottle comprises a base having an internal parabolic surface and wherein the bottle has an air inlet when the closure has no air channel. Now we'll proceed to the opening of the letter to the European Patent Office. Your opening paragraph of the letter should be clear and simple without any extraneous matter or padding. You have a wide choice of wordings. Choose a wording that suits you and stick to it also for your real life replies to the EPO. Here is my suggested wording. In reply to the communication dated or just in reply to the communication, the applicant submits a replacement set of amended claims and requests accelerated examination under the PACE program. Note that the request for accelerated examination, which is made according to the client's wish, should mention the words PACE program and could also mention the guidelines reference, guidelines part, part E, Roman 7, 3.2. Note that you, there is no superfluous uh, material such as the EPO address or stating the, the, the means of sending. Next, we tackle the basis uh, and explanations of the amendments. You have to state the basis of the amended claims, claim, starting with claim one, and you have a wide choice for wording and presentation. Here I've used a header, basis explanation of amendments, and I use headers also in my everyday dealings with the European Patent Office. The explanation reads as follows. The pre-characterizing part of amended claim one is based on original claim one, from which the feature an air channel has been deleted. The added characterizing part of claim, amended claim one is based on original claim three. Then I go on to say, deletion of an air channel does not contravene article 1232 EPC because the amendment meets up to the three point test of guidelines H Roman V 3.1 as follows. And we do need a thorough justification for the removal of the feature and the three-point test is the standard way of doing this. It's not enough to simply quote the three-point test. You have to integrate the given facts into the test's three points. So the first point, non-essentiality, uh, I start, one, according to the description, the feature is not essential. That is a statement of the three-point test. And then I add the facts. Paragraph 11 says that closures according to the invention do not need to have an air channel when the closures are used with a container comprising its own air inlet. Figure 1 shows a closure according to the invention with no air channel where the container has an air inlet 7. So you have many possibilities for integrating the facts into the three-point test, and you can do this uh, as, as you wish. We'll go now to point two of the test. So here's point two of the three-point test, not indispensable for carrying out the invention. And I repeat that in the opening words of the argument, the feature is not indispensable for carrying out the invention. As shown, for example, in figure one, the invention can be carried out with a closure having no air inlet if the closure is used with a container having an air inlet. So there again, you have many possibilities for framing that argument. Next, we'll move to point three of the argument, no compensating uh, modification for carrying out the invention. So we start point three, 
The removal of the feature requires no real modification of the other features to compensate for the change. That is a statement from the three-point test. And then we add the facts. Claim 1 covers the closure per se. Figure 1 shows that the closure itself requires no modification to compensate for the absence of an air inlet. All that is required is to provide the container with an air inlet. This is not a modification of a feature of the closure. Note that when I've, in arguing the three-point test, I've, I've taken the introductory words from the three-point test itself, and it's a good idea if you would have bring with, with you in the exam some notes on s such standard wordings that you can copy out instead of relying on your memory. Next, we'll comment on claim two, which is a minor point. The wording of claim two is unchanged, but this claim depends on amended claim one, which includes the subject matter of original claim three. However, original claim three was dependent on claim one or two, so the combination of claim one plus claim three plus claim two was already disclosed. Therefore, no subject matter is added. Lot of words for very, very little credit there. Now we turn to claim three, which is also a minor point. New claim three corresponds to original claim four, except that it has been made dependent on any preceding claim based on the dependency of cancelled claim three. The added words wherein the vibrator unit comprises are based on paragraph nine. Note that the examiner raised a clarity objection for original claim three, but it's best to deal with this separately, and we will deal it with it separately later. Next we go to claim four. Claim four is a new claim based on the words deleted from original claim one, another minor point. And then we go to claim five. Claim 5 is a new claim directed to a system of a bottle in combination with a closure, as claimed, as disclosed in paragraph 3, which also provides basis for such bottle having a base with an internal parabolic surface. Wherein the bottle has an air inlet when the closure has no air channel is based on paragraph 11 and figure 1. Note that claim 5 was given a major amount of credit by the examiners. The examiner's solution for claim 1 was different to mine in that they left out the last phrase wherein the, the bottle has an air inlet when the closure has no air channel and instead they made claim 5 dependent on claim 4 which covered an air inlet. And according to the examiner's report, extra credit was available for explaining why the system of Claim 5 com complies with Rule 137.5 EPC and why it complies with the unity co condition of Article 82. So that was missed out from my answer. Now we turn to the objection under Article 84 EPC, which has its own header, and I say this. The objection to lack of support of original claim 4 under Article 84 EPC raised in paragraph 4 of the communication has been removed by adding the words wherein the vibrator unit comprises a vibrator plate to the corresponding new claim 3. The amended claim is supported by paragraph 9. Note then that it's best to deal with an objection under Article 84 to lack of clarity or lack of support separately from the arguments for basis of the claim and compliance with Article 1232 EPC. My wording for this claim, I notice, is not as good as the wording in the examiner's report. The examiner said... Present claim 3 has been amended to claim that the vibrator plate has a parabolic surface it, 
having a par parabolic surface is part of the vibrator unit, which is quite neat. Then we turn to novelty. So we have a new header, novelty article 54. For novelty, you simply have to point out a feature which renders claim one novel over each prior art reference, D1 and D2. My specimen states as follows. Claim one is novel over D1 because D1's vibrator is a tuning fork, not a piezoelectric vibrator. Claim one is novel over D2 because D2's closure does not include a vibrator. D2's piezoelectric vibrator is mounted on the bottle base, not in its closure. Note that there is not a great deal of need to elaborate these arguments for this year's exam. Uh, and we can say that in general, when novelty can be demonstrated easily, it carries rather a small amount of credit. However, if the novelty objection is more complicated, uh, then there will be more credit and you have to put in a more detailed argument. Okay. Now we turn to inventive step using the problem and solution format, starting with the closest prior art. We have a header, inventive step, article 56 EPC. Note that you have a wide choice in the way you form formulate your explanations and arguments. It's very important to provide factual reasons for justifying the closest prior art. Avoid generic statements like D1 is the closest prior art because it has the same aim as the invention. Here is my example then. D1 is the closest prior art because it discloses a closure having a vibrator arranged to accelerate the maturing process of a beverage which is the same aim as the invention, paragraph three. In paper B, it is usual to explain why the other prior art is not so close. And this uh, argument or statement uh, serves as a sort of precursor for your arguments for inventive step. So my argument for D2 goes like this. D2 is not so close because its vibrator is remote from its closure and it pursues a different aim, namely micro-shaking segments. Note, however, that for the opposition paper C, the opponent, that is you as a candidate, are not expected to explain why other prior art is less close. We now turn to the claims differentiating feature. The subject matter of claim one is differentiated from D1 or differs from E1 by its characterizing features, namely that the vibrator unit comprises a piezoelectric vibrator for generating the sound waves at different frequencies. You don't have to use a header for the differentiating feature, but it can be useful to keep on track. You should state how the claim differentiates over the prior art and not how the prior art differentiates over the claim. Next then is the technical effect associated with the difference. Here we go. The effect of having a closure with a vibrator unit that comprises a piezoelectric vibrator for generating the sound waves at different frequencies is that a single closure can generate sound waves at different frequencies. Therefore, specific flavors can be selectively developed in an alcoholic beverage using a single closure. The effect is quoted from the statement of advantages in the client's letter and according to the examiner's report extra credit was available 
for making a more elaborate formulation of advantages derived from the documents. Note that the technical effect is nearly always to be found in the counterpart to the claim features of the description. In this particular case, it was very convenient to use the client's letter as a shortcut to finding an uh, advantage. As the client's description of advantage was eloquent, it did not seem necessary to look further in the description, but I could and perhaps should have quoted paragraph 6 of the description. Next, we have to formulate the objective technical problem. Expression of the objective technical problem is subjective in that different people can express it in different ways. You have to find your way of expressing the problem. Most important is not to include elements of the solution in the problem. For example, you should avoid stating a problem as follows. Providing a closure for a beverage container for promoting different specific flavors in the beverage by generating sound waves at different frequencies. Here, the generating sound waves at different frequencies is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. Here then is my statement of the objective technical problem. The objective technical problem can be formulated as providing a closure for a beverage container for accelerating the maturing process of a beverage and for promoting different specific flavors in the beverage using a single closure. As I said, the objective technical problem can be formulated in different ways. Here is the examiner's wording that they gave as an example. Providing a beverage closure for accelerating the maturing process of a beverage which is capable of promoting specific different flavors. So how did you uh, express your problem? Having stated the problem, then we start on the reasons for unobviousness or support for inventive step. Major credit is available for the arguments in support of inventive step. 20 points, in fact, were available for this segment of the answer. In my opinion, it's difficult to obtain full marks under this category, but it's well within the reach, within your reach or most candidates' reach, to obtain more than half marks, meaning if you do that, you'll be on your way to passing the exam. You should always begin the discussion of unobviousness by stating why the skilled person would not arrive at the subject matter of the claim, starting from the closest prior art taken alone. So here then is my opening for the reasons for unobviousness. Starting from D1 alone, the skilled person finds no hint or suggestion that could guide him towards the subject matter of claim one. That is an overall sta a general statement uh, that we can use in arguments, but it has no factual basis. So then we have to put in the factual basis for the, in support of that statement. D1's closure has a mechanical tuning fork with an inner part 104 that generates sound waves in, a bev in the beverage, whiskey, driven by an external tuning fork 109 that receives sound wave from an ex external loudspeaker. Okay, then we go to the next paragraph. To promote different specific flavors in the beverage, D1 proposes to use different closures with differently dimensioned tuning forks. This teaches away from the claim solution of a single closure for this purpose. Moreover, D1's loudspeaker-driven tuning fork arrangement is not suggestive of using a piezoelectric vibrator in the container's disclosure. 
Note that I've put some words in red. The words in red are more or less standard wording, and the words in dark blue or black are more or less effects in integrated from the uh, documents. The discussion of D1 should bring in facts from D1 and should not overly rely on standard phrases like the first sentence on the last page. Starting from D1 alone, the skilled person finds no hint or suggestion that could guide him towards the subject matter of claim one. Or the last sentence on the next slide, which says, consequently, the skilled person cannot reach the claim solution in any obvious way, way from D1. You're going to get credit for the facts that you put in between these standard statements. The standard statements do not count for much on their own. And you have great freedom to express your argument in the way you feel comfortable, uh, depending on your perception of D1. This first part of the argument is concluded on the next slide. As I mentioned, the conclusion is, consequently, the skilled person cannot reach the claim solution in any obvious way from D1 alone. This is a, a sort of an intermediate conclusion for the first segment of the argument. The virtue of having an intermediate conclusion is to separate the arguments one from the other. So it, it helps to separate from the next part of the argument that turns to the secondary prior art. So we now turn over the page and note that the next step of the argument is to consider whether the skilled person would consider combining the closest prior art with the other documents. This usually gives you the opportunity to explain firstly why the skilled person would not be inclined to combine the documents, and secondly, why the, skilled, why the postulated combination falls short of the claimed solution. So now I'm continuing with the reasons for unobviousness, and it goes as follows. Faced with the objective problem of accelerating the maturing process of a beverage and promoting different specific flavors in the beverage, the skilled person finds from a cursory glance that D2 pursues a different aim, namely micro-shaking segments under pressure. There is simply no teaching whatsoever in D2 of accelerating the maturing process of a beverage and promoting different specific flavors in the beverage. So the next part of the argument now is going to be carried on over the next several slides. We continue. To the contrary, D2 teaches operating at a fixed frequency of 0 0.1 kilohertz, which is ineffective for solving the problem of accelerating maturing of a beverage and for promoting specific flavors in the beverage. I could have quoted a basis for that. D2, furthermore, teaches operating in a pressurized closed vessel, whereas the application, paragraph 11, makes it plain that an air channel in the closure or in the air bottle is essential for maturing of the, uh, of the liquid, is essential in a bottle closure system. So by pointing out the differences with D2, you can emphasize why a combination would be ineffective to solve the objective problem, so the skilled person would not embark on a, a combination. And we continue over leaf. Consequently, the skilled person would not consider a combination of D1 and D2 with a view to solving the objective problem. That uh, there again is, after some generalities, you conclude that the skilled person would not be inclined to consider a combination of D1-2, and then afterwards we need to discuss theoretical combinations of D1 and D2 that in principle will not lead to the subject matter of claim 1. So then we carry on. However, if the skilled person did consider a combination, he would find no useful teaching as D2's arrangement is incompatible with the claimed solution. 
D2's arrangement comprises a piezoelectric vibrator which operates at a fixed frequency of 0.1 kHz in order to minimize generation of carbon dioxide gas. And then we turn over. This does not lead to the inventive uh, feature of a vibrator. I, I originally had a mechanical vibrator, and I crossed out mechanical, of a vibrator for generating sound waves at different frequencies. The skilled person knows from D1 paragraph 3 that virtually no acceleration of the maturing process could be expected at frequencies below 1 kHz. So D2 is teaching away from use, using useful frequencies at which the advantage of promoting specific different flavors in the beverage could be reached. This is a little bit of a tricky argument in a way because um, we are more or less saying that our invention is inoperative below 1 kilohertz. One, uh, uh, and as we don't have any uh, correspondence, we don't have a, an explanation to give to the examiner, we just have to risk this and put down what we have said. So there again, we continue over leaf. D2's piezoelectric vibrator is configured to fit on and extend over the outer surface of the bottle's base. D2's application requires that a piezoelectric vibrator having a width of several centimeters is used. Clearly, the vibrator is not configured so it could be fitted in a bottle closure. This makes a combination of D2 with D1 impossible or highly unlikely. So here we have explained the incompatibility between the size of D2's vibrator and the dimensions of a bottleneck. And we continue of relief. Here we are going to consider the postulated combination of D2's vibrator and D1's closure and the argument continues like this. Moreover, no combination of D2 with D1 will lead to the subject matter of claim 1 because if D2's vibrator were suitably redimensioned and redesigned to fit in D1's bottle closure, it will only operate at a fixed frequency of 0.1 kHz, which is ineffective for solving the problem of accelerating maturing of a beverage and for promoting different specific flavors in the beverage. And we turn over. Moreover, the postulated combination of D2's modified closure in D1's closure would be ineffective for producing the micro-shaking taught by D2, which requires vibrating the bottle with its neck down in order to remove sed sediment. See paragraph 1 of D2. This makes the postulated combination doubly unobvious because it would lose the advantage of D2 without achieving the advantage of D1. One. So here we've considered sort of a double reason for un unobviousness, which is something I ne that never occurred to me before. Now we put in a concluding paragraph. Um, the, in fact, the argument is very long, and it, it really needs to be brought to a conclusion. So we have to bring it to a conclusion as soon as uh, the argument is more or less complete. And the conclusion will say, for example, this is a standard concluding phrase, it follows that as the subject matter of claim one cannot be reached in any obvious way from the prior art D1 alone or taking into account D2, it must be regarded as involving an inventive step under Article 56 EPC. As claims 2 to 5 all depend on claim 1, they involve an inventive step 2. So that is a standard concluding phrase, and you can use your own standard concluding phrase to bring your argument to an end. Uh, you will note that the arguments are long, and this comes from the fact that the exam client expects you to bring in all relevant facts from the documents, which means that if we spot anything in the documents, we should bring it in in order to get credit. However, um, rest assured that you can obtain good credit with a shorter letter or shorter arguments, 
bringing in a dose, a relevant dose of uh, good facts. So this brings our processing of the 2013 paper B to an end. Here now is a summary of the paper B processing. Your letter to the EPO follows a predefined format. You can use the same format for your replies to EPO communications at work. You can and you should use the same format for assimilating information and for your planning for your paper B reply. For this, you can bring to the exam some sheets accord, uh, organized according to the predefined format that you can use for gathering the information for putting together your plan. By filling up your plan, you are rehearsing writing of the answer, so it will be able, you will be able to write it rapidly following the plan while integrating text from the documents. Depending on your inclination and the way you tackle the paper, you may find it convenient to merge some of the planning into the reading phase, or some, some of the reading into the planning phase, but it's not a good idea to go ahead with writing the answer before you have a complete plan. If you get into a mode of plan as you write your answer, uh, this makes the writing come planning very time consuming and you may find that you use a lot of time and you run out of time and you have difficulties to finish the paper. So what is next? It's important to, to familiarize yourself with the working method for paper B because you can use a similar approach for the opposition paper C and for the D2 legal opinion. The working method for paper B requires collecting together all of the information in the format of your planned reply letter. In the opposition paper, you can create a working format for gathering and organizing information based upon the claims to be opposed. In other words, in the opposition, you take the claims to be opposed and all of your, your organization and planning is done as a function of the claims to be opposed. In the D2 legal opinion, you can create a working format for gathering and organizing information based on the client's questions. In other words, all of the organizing of the information you need for the legal opinion should be done based upon the framework given by the questions that the client asks you to answer. In the near future, I will be publishing a tutorial on the opposition paper, and I hope you will join in with that too. This brings our tutorial on reply EQE paper B to an end. I hope it has been of value to you. Be on the lookout for upcoming tutorials on other EQE subjects that will be announced on the Pat Skills blogspot. For further guidance on EQE preparation, you can, and I recommend that you do consult the book EQE Comprehensive, available from shopmybooks.com, search word patent. A bientôt.